Um, our next speaker is no stranger to the FIT community. Her book, Refashioned, celebrates 46 international designers who are pioneering sustainable practices while providing appealing choices for consumers, resulting in a book that really takes the concept of repurposing to dizzying new heights. Please join me in welcoming designer, eco-fashion activist, and FIT's assistant dean, Sass Brown. Hello, good evening. Okay, um, thank you for being here. This is a, an intimate audience, so I'm gonna try and keep it relatively informal, I think. Um, to follow on from that lovely introduction, thank you very much, um, Patricia and Lawrence King and the Love Your Library Week, so thank you. Um, these are the covers on the screen here of my last two books, uh, Eco Fashion and Refashioned. Refashioned is the most recent one. Eco Fashion, the one on the left, your left, yes, um, was really about big picture um, ethical fashion and what was going on in the industry. Um, I wanted to write about what was happening in ethical fashion space because most of it's happening in the emerging market and because of that much of it is very localized and there isn't very much information for people in the industry or people that aspire to the industry or consumers that want to buy it about what's happening and what's going on. So I thought it was really important to talk about and to share a lot of the examples of really great design that's happening around the world in various um, emerging designer markets. Um, so the first book, Eco Fashion, was sort of big picker. picture, ethical fashion. It broke ethical fashion down into working with reclaimed materials, it worked fair trade, new business models, um, designer initiatives, um, organic and natural or other sustainable fabrications. Um, and then the one on the right really was an outgrowth, refashioned was an outgrowth of the first book, Eco Fashion, because there were just so many designers doing really fabulous things with recycling and upcycling materials, um, with really great conceptual design that I, I couldn't fit them all in one chapter in the book. So it really just made its own book in the end. Um, and I, in both cases, it really is about sharing what great examples there are around the world because there's really phenomenal things happening. So I think it's really important to tell those stories and to share those stories of what's happening to move our industry ahead. Um, I'm very fortunate that I get to travel relatively widely, not quite as widely as I used to, but I always make a point of, of adding on research, no matter where I am in the world, to find out what's happening in the emerging and the craft sector in wh whatever location I find myself. Um, I also live on the internet, so when I can't visit somewhere, I'm visiting it digitally to see who's doing what. Um, and the digital space is actually the great connector in the ethical fashion movement because, again, um, it really is um, an, part, an industry that is governed by emerging small localized markets, so small makers, designers, etc. And so the connection worldwide is digital as opposed to physical, They're getting their word out outside of their communities and outside of their uh, particular location is a challenge. So we all communicate via the social networks. So I live, along with many, many people in this space, on any number of social networks. I have my own website, I, do my, I have a newsletter, I live on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you name it, I'm on it, as are all of the people in this community, whether they're designers, whether they are other bloggers, whether they're writers, whether they're researchers or educators. This is our connection. Um, it's also the space for activism. Everything that's happening, happening in um, activism in, in the ethical fashion movement is also happening in the social media space. So it really is the connector. Um, I'm, as a writer and as a researcher, I write for a number of different publications. I'm the New York editor for Coco Echo magazine, which is a kind of glossy e-zine, actually it's a physically printed publication these days as well, based out of LA that's to do with eco-lifestyles um, and celebrity. And then I was the um, international features editor for Above magazine, which unfortunately is no more, um, hopefully not as a result of my writing, but uh, uh, so that was a, another uh, magazine publication that I write for, and a number of different webs, blogs, um, etc. 
I also advise and write for two country-wide uh, agencies which help sustain the fashion industries in those countries, one in Denmark and one in Sweden. So um, much of my writing in the academic space is done through them. So I'm part of a movement, really, uh, in ethical fashion and activism. And what we do collectively is celebrate and honor the work of designers that are acting as change agents in an industry that really is experiencing revolution at the moment and has been for some time. So I'm one of many people who communicate um, about the problems in the main fa mainstream fashion system, um, as well as telling the stories around those that are making a difference. Um, so designers from around the world, really, that are challenging the system of fashion, whether they're working with uh, new materials or recontextualizing ancient techniques, or they're making conscious choices through their work. I write about design specifically um, as important as ecology. Uh, because I don't think producing any more ugly, boring clothes is really a very sustainable thing to do. There's enough of them out there already. Um, and because, honestly, it's my, that's the part of the conversation I can add to. As a designer being my background um, and working in higher-end design, that's part of the conversation that I can add to. We all have our own voices, and the collective total conversation is really valuable, but we all have to have our own space within it. And it's also because I really believe that um, aspirational design is what motivates our industry to move on. So I think it's really important to talk about that. These are some of my colleagues and uh, uh, friends in the industry that will also produce blogs, websites, e-zines, any number of things, whether it's Ecoter, Eco Salon, uh, Coco Echo magazine, um, any number of different publications. So why is this important? There are a number of reasons. Um, here's a few sort of basic, simple facts. The average lifespan of a piece of clothing in the Western world is three years. That's an average lifespan for any piece of clothing that people buy. Now, clearly, that means an awful lot of pieces of clothing don't last nearly three years. And it's not that they wear out in those three years. It's that they're discarded at the end of those three years. So and much of that uh, discarding of clothing and textiles ends up in landfill. And so, clearly, this is an issue that we have to deal with. Um, fast fashion, of course, is a big um, part of the reason how we've moved from clothing as an investment in past generations to clothing to really what's a disposable consumable. Um, it's important because the average American buys about 68 garments a year. 68 garments a year, I think it's about seven or eight pairs of shoes or boots a year as well. That's an average consumer in the US. Out of that, 85% of it ends up in landfill. And 95% of all textiles can actually be recycled in some way, shape, or form. Possibly 100%, 95 is actually a slightly conservative um, estimate. Because the mainstream fashion system builds in 15% of waste at every stage of production. So right from collecting the fiber or extruding the uh, chemical through to cutting, sewing, making, shipping, etc., retailing, consuming, 15% of waste at every stage. That's a massive uh, producer of waste that ends up again in landfill. Um, out of those 95% of textiles that are actually recyclable but end up in landfill, you have a lot of problems that are associated with that. Um, you have, for example, synthetic fibers, of course. So polyester and the like don't decompose in what we call a scalable timeline, which means we've really no idea how long it takes for them to decompose because they haven't been around long enough. Much like plastic bags, it's considered that polyester will take somewhere in the region of two to 500 years to decompose. Um, but because it hasn't been around that long, we really don't know. So. Uh, even um, natural fibers have issues when you put them in landfill. You have the chemicals that the, the fabrics have been dyed with or printed with or finished with that then go into the soil or into the water table. You also have the fact that some fibers, such as wool, actually emit methane as they decompose, and methane is a major contributor to global warming. Um, so then you have the exportation of our wasted clothing to the African continent predominantly and how that's detrimentally affected uh, their fledgling apparel and textile industries. So there are ramifications all over for the discarding of those um, 
number of 85 pounds of textiles every year. There are also a number of ways that they can be recycled, so that 85% um, of, of garments that ends up in textile, um, in landfill, there's a number of things we can do with it. Good quality garments, of course, can be resold. Um, damaged good quality garments can be mended, redesigned, recut. Um, and then you've got natural fibers with a wool or cotton, etc., that can be shredded down and respun. In fact, the photo on the left is from Prato. Um, it's a group or a conglomerate of factories called uh, Cardato in Prato, which is a, the first certified zero waste textile in the world. Prato have been recycling wool for generations. It's sort of that wool production dirty secret that they never told anyone that those high quality Italian wools are actually made from a percentage of recycled wool until it became a bit uh, a bit more um, cool and trendy to talk about, so now they, they say that they've been doing it, but they've been doing it for hundreds of years. Um, so they color sort them, as you can see, and then they're shredded down and they're rewoven. Cotton can be too. The image on the right is from um, Nudie Jeans, which is a, a Danish company, and they shred cotton. There's now a few people that shred cotton. It's not the easiest fiber to re um, weave. Anyone who knows anything about textiles, the hand, the feel, the quality of a textile is based on the length of the staple, so the length of the fiber that's being twisted and then woven. And when you shred something, you're shortening that, so you're also affecting the quality of the fiber. So they have to reweave cotton with natural uh, virgin materials. So in Nudie's case, they reweave the about 20% of recycled cotton with 80% virgin organic cotton. So it can be done, but uh, it's just not 100%. Um, so as I said, what I like to do is really to tell stories um, about the designers through my writing, whether it's my books, whether it's my blog or website or whatever, um, and about designers that are challenging the system, the mainstream system of fashion, because it really very much is a system. Um, and there are a number of them who've managed to turn really the model of luxury and high-end design almost completely on its head by recontextualizing what we understand and we generally recognize as luxury materials or luxury designs. These are designers, and I'm talking specifically now about the designers in my last book, Refashioned, that work with discarded materials. Um, so through their labor, through their love, through their craftsmanship and through their talent, they managed to completely recontextualize discarded materials into something that is entirely um, desirable and completely new. And those are the designers that I'm going to talk about tonight because they're the designers that are in my last book, Refashioned. So, as I said, talking about telling the stories, I'm just going to give some examples of the designers that are in that book that have stories around what they do, how they came to be uh, working with this materials, and what materials they use. So um, this is one designer who I think uh, recontextualizes waste, probably more poetically than most. Um, it's an Austrian brand called Steinweider. And um, why I say more poetically than most is because they choose one of the most challenging uh, materials to upcycle that you could probably think of, and that's actually used socks. So the bulk of their collection is produced from recycled, discarded, used socks. So if you're talking about um, a material that is not just undervalued, it's actually considered distasteful for the most part. And here's a brand that chooses actively chooses to use this material, not because they have to, not because they were forced to, but because they, they wish to, to recontextualize it, reimagine it, and reuse it. And they do it really without uh, compromising their sense of style. It's a very edgy, rebellious collection. You can see it's sort of very grunge-based, um, but it, it doesn't compromise in any way their aesthetic choices. Um, in actual fact, it adds to it in many ways because the dimension of a sock, if you think of the way a sock it doesn't really sit flat, you've got the heel that pokes up, so it has this, um, this dimension to it that adds to the overall representation and presentation in the garment that can't be mimicked by um, new materials. It couldn't be made through any other materials than socks. Um, like many of the designers that work in recycled materials, they sort of came to this realization um, 
through organic means. Um, many of the designers that work with waste materials do so because they found out about that waste stream, that this number of materials was being wasted. In their case, their studio was uh, located very close to a sock factory. So when they first started, they were actually working with virgin socks and sock production, much like any other textile or garment production, has its waste. So missized socks, miscolored socks, wrong dye orders, orders that weren't fulfilled, damages, all of those things, she started working with those. Turned out to be a limited resource, and so she moved on to uh, used socks. So if you ever wondered where that one sock goes every time you do your laundry, it probably ends up with Steinweider in Austria. I don't know how she gets them, but... Uh, the collection is now predominantly made from used socks. Um, and she really does work with these materials to um, showcase them in their best light. And as I said, this is a choice um, she makes. And it's not about a second-rate source of materials. It's really about actively choosing to highlight the value and the uniqueness of those materials. And that's what all of the designers that I talk about and write about do. And if you see, for example, um, the design on the extreme right, you can see it much more clearly in the lighter garment. She color sorts like a lot of designers do her base materials. And then you've got this variation in texture, in weight, in dimension. And it's really a, 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 quite a skill what she does. These aren't, she doesn't make a big piece of fabric with them all pieced together and then cut them out and sew a sweatshirt, for example. They're actually draped um, in three dimensions on the mannequin with the socks. So there's no seams here other than the seams that are around the socks themselves. They're not applied to a base material they're really pieced together like a jigsaw puzzle. So it's actually quite a testament to the skill level. And it, of course, makes everything, every single piece unique. Every, as with all of the designers, when you're working with people's waste, whether it's pre or post consumer, every time your materials are different. So it means every single piece is unique in some way, shape, or form. So that's Steinweider. This is From Somewhere. Um, Ursula de Castro is the founder of From Somewhere, and she's based in the UK. She's actually also the founder of Aesthetica. So anyone that knows anything about the ethical fashion scene, Aesthetica is one of the most important eco-fashion trade shows in the world. It's part of London Fashion Week, and has been part of London Fashion Week for a number of years. So Ursula founded that. <clears throat> and she shows a number of designers, quite highly edited, uh, tight, um, range of designers through that, sh through that show. Um, but she also has her own line called From Somewhere. And she's, as you might guess from the name, Italian by origin. And so she works with a number of Italian producers, um, luxury designer producers, so many labels that you would recognize, and gets the waste from their manufacturers, so directly from the factories. She started uh, by working with uh, a number of actually wearing a sweater from her grandmother that had some marks and stains on it, so in, but she really wanted to wear it to a particular event, and so she embellished this piece of knitwear and got so many compliments at some event that she was attending that she decided she would produce a collection from other people's damaged knitwear. And so she started sourcing damaged knitwear from other manufacturers and again embellishing um, them with crochet and other means, embroidery and so on, to actually sort of honor, in a way, the halls and the marks rather than cover them up, became an absolute instant success. Um, she was selling in the UK through Topshop, I believe, at the time. And she moved on from there to, to base her entire uh, business on working with other people's waste. And what she used for the most part, and what all these designs are actually from, and what forms the bulk basis of her collection, is what they call mill headers. Anyone who works in the fashion industry knows that every mill that produces swatches, produces textiles, shows those swatches to the designers for the upcoming season in what we call headers. They're usually quite substantial big squares of fabric that the designer looks at and says, yes, I want to sample this and order it for my next season. At the end of the season there, they again usually discard it because they're last season's goods at that stage and the mill makes a whole new range for the next season. And so she would source all of those wasted swatches 
or headers from the mills and from the agents. And so, hence her collection is made out of all of these pieced pieces. So you can see how there are multiples of different fabrics, different qualities, different colors, different prints in all of her designs. And each piece is made out of limited um, sizes because that's the sizes that the swatches came in. So that's really how she made her name. Um, she's done a number of things. Um, she's an extremely well-respected uh, designer in this space. One of the ones that really does have a reach well beyond her, her market in the UK. And so she also has a, a brand called Reclaim to Wear, which actually started by working with Central St. Martins in the UK and students and teaching them how to work with upcycled materials. Um, so now she also works with Topshop. I think Topshop recently moved to the US, so you probably know who they are. They're a bit similar to H&M, basically. One of those massive UK, high fast fashion retailers that are absolutely everywhere. Um, so inevitably, these types of retailers have enormous waste, uh, damages, unsold goods. So now she works with their leftover fabric cuttings from their manufacture to produce a collection that is sold through Topshop. Hopefully that's something that will go on. She's actually really probably the first designer to do this on a mass level with a, a major retailer. So a lot of designers working on very small scale, doing it for their own collection, selling through their own store or through pop-ups or whatever, but not doing it on a mass scale. Osler is probably the only one. Um, so working with top shops. Uh, collection, uh, leftover collection fabrics. But what she's probably best known for is a particular collaboration she did with Speedo. Um, for those of you who remember the 1990s, uh, Speedo had a, a racer suit in commercial, in um, competitive swimming called the LZR racer suit. Uh, Mark Spitz and a bunch of other uh, swimmers run, won a large number of, of medals wearing those swimsuits. Um, and then it was eventually banned. It was banned in 2010, I think it was, finally, um, because the governing body of um, competitive swimming decided that it gave the swimmers an unfair advantage against other swimmers. And that would have been fine if all swimmers um, that were doing competitive swimming could actually get hold of the LZR racer, but they couldn't because most swim teams are actually sponsored by swimsuit manufacturers. So if Speedo wasn't your sponsor, if Puma was or, any, or Nike, you weren't about to be wearing a Speedo swimsuit. So it gave... Um, those teams that were sponsored by Speedo an unfair advantage, so it was banned. This left Speedo in a rather difficult situation with thousands of these uh, swimsuits left and there's not much you can do with a, a, a competitive swimsuit that goes from the neck to the wrist to the ankle. Um, you can't sell it to anyone else. It's really not a ter terribly uh, commercially viable garment if you're not wearing it to shave microseconds off your speed in swimming. Um, so they were left with a lot of the fabric and a lot of the garments, and they didn't know what to do with it. Um, most brands in that position burn their merchandise. Uh, brands at, at this sort of, particularly in competitive sports, their brand and their logo is sacrosanct, and it's on everything. So you can't cut it up, you can't do anything with it. So they usually rather burn excess merchandise than do anything with it. So what Speedo did, which was really enlightened and unusual, was they decided instead to give some of those swimsuits to a range of different designers and artists in lots of different fields and say, let's see what you can come up with. Have a hack around with them, no restrictions. You can cut through the logo, you can do whatever you want, and let's see what you come up with. One of those designers was Orsula. And the collection was so successful that it's been going now f since 2010. It's still currently being sold through ukes.com, through Selfridges in the UK, and a number of really high-end boutiques around the world. So this is part of uh, one of the first collections that she did from the Speedo swimsuits. So you can see they're all cut up. They have nothing in common with commercial uh, swimsuits, competitive swimsuits at all. It's a fashion collection. Um, and it's sold extremely well, got enormous press for Speedo and for Orsula, and has been extremely successful. So it continues um, to be successful and to be sold, and it's gone through a number of iterations, like any collection. There's a new collection every season. Um, and she quite strategically launched it on particular timelines. There was an exclusive launch at Selfridges in the UK, which is a high-end um, department store, 
bit like, sort of like Macy's in as much as there are several of them, but higher end. And it was um, launched to coincide with Climate Week. And then the digital launch was with ukes.com, which was one of the first and the biggest um, e-commerce retailers for fashion, was um, launched on International Earth Day. So this is uh, another brand. Uh, this is a Berlin-based brand called Schmidt Takahashi. As you might guess from the name, it's a partnership, one partner called Schmidt, the other one called Takahashi. And uh, they're a really interesting partnership. Um, they work with, they work with um, recycling bins, so garment or textile recycling bins that are around Berlin area. Um, but what is unusual about them, when those garments are dropped off, in their uh, unwanted clothing recycling bins, they get some of the history of the garment from the person that's donating them, and they record that history. So what was the piece of clothing that's being donated? How, who was it owned by? Where was it worn? Information like that, and they record it, and they, they keep it on QR codes. Um, and then they make a collection out of all of these garments. And they have these really incongruous pairings of garments. So they'll put a, a puffer jacket paired with a silk pleated skirt, paired with something else. And they're all cut up and redesigned. And they have this very quirky collection that has a very unique aesthetic um, and quite an unexpected one. Um, part of that, of course, is this, comp this partnership combination. You have a Japanese and a German designer who are collaborating on a collection. and so. When all of these garments are cut up, and there might be three or five different garments that are cut up to make a single design in the end, each one of them has this embedded QR code. And so the customer that buys that dress, that skirt, whatever, has a QR code that they can then input the number or scan it with a smartphone app and read the history of where their garments came from and find out who wore them, what they were used for, where they came from. It's actually something that's been used successfully in other areas. Oxfam, which is a big um, uh, <coughs> um, let me see, there are, I, I, I can't think of the right word. There are a company in the UK that deal with recycled fashion for charity. And they do a, an annual event where they have a lot of celebrities donate the clothing, and they embed in those pieces of clothing the history. Of course, then you've got video clips of someone quite famous talking about where they wore that dress. So there's an obvious uh, connection there to revaluing and reselling. So Schmidt Takahashi do it for ordinary stories and where these clothes came from. So you get to see the history, and that's part of the value of recycled clothing, is this sense of history, this where did it come from, who wore it. It has a story attached to it already, and that's what they celebrate through these materials. You can't really talk about um, anything in ethical fashion without talking about Natalie Channing from Alabama Channing. Um, she's an American designer, of course, and based out of Florence, Alabama, hence the name. Um, and she's actually, the piece on the cover of my first book, Eco Fashion, is one of her designs, and she also wrote the foreword and the introduction for my second book, Refashioned. Um, and she's one of many designers who really, it's very difficult to put a label on what she does because it doesn't fall neatly into she works with recycled materials or she works with organic materials or she does fair trade because she does all of those things like many people do. So, uh, but she did start, a lot of her original collection was working with recycled t-shirts. If you look way back to uh, her inception, that she's particularly known for a, 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 a a key piece in her collection all the way from when she started till now, which is a corset top, has all of these um, corsetry type lines on it, cut out of cotton jersey. When she started, they were out of logo t-shirts, so you'd get little bits of logos on all of these pieces. She still makes the top now, it's beautifully embellished and embroidered, it's no longer out of other people's logo t-shirts. Uh, much of it's out of organic cotton, she now owns her own cotton field. Um, but she does also continue to use recycled cotton. And what's really special about what she does is, again, this recontextualization of materials. She uses cotton jersey. The entirety of her collection is made out of cotton jersey, simple, simple humble cotton jersey that your undies are made from, your vest is made from. Um, you know, So these are materials that in and of themselves are not luxurious, don't have an incredible value 
but the labor and the craftsmanship and the love and the talent that she pours into working with these materials is what gives them that value. And her workmanship is exquisite. Every piece in her main collection is hand sewn. And I mean every single stitch, every seam. It's not just that they're hand embellished and they're sewn together by machines. They're not. Every single stitch is done by hand. Um, her collection is very much based around the location of where she lives, Florence, Alabama. It's very rich um, history of cotton growth, um, of quilting circles, and that's really where the idea came from. It was about bringing women together about that culture of creation, whether it was prom dress and apple pie or her collection. It was about honoring that um, female domestic arts, and that's really what she grew out of, and it's gone into building an entire community in Florence, Alabama, that honors and um, values all sorts of creators, from chefs to musicians to designers. Um, so the collection is a reversal of what uh, the traditional quilting is, which is she uses a couple of layers of fabric, um, usually two different colors or two different tones. She screen prints usually. Um, the top layer, and then it's hand sewn around very roughly, I, I shouldn't say roughly, but um, naively with running stitches and knots and the end sticking out. So sh part of that is to honor that craftsmanship, the fact that this, and showing that this is all hand done. None of this could be done by machine. And then those designs are then cut within the sewn circles to reveal the color underneath. Um, she does an, lots and lots of different techniques, but that's her basic one. And they are absolutely exquisite. You really do need to see them, to touch them, to, to fully appreciate the work that's gone into them. But you can see, I know it's a bit hard in this lighting, but you can see the workmanship, the layers. The stripes, for example, that's not printed. The stripes on the, the top, the bottom of the top there, those are all applied pieces or cutaway layers. Um, everything that you see, all of the marks are embroideries and cutouts and prints. So they're extremely labor intensive. She does now actually, she started what she calls the factory line just this year, so this is, is new for her, so she does actually now do a machine produced line, and that's part of growing it and making her clothing more accessible. Inevitably, the hand sewn pieces are not cheap, they honor the labor and the workmanship that's gone into them, and they pay fair labor wages, so you can pay anywhere between two and five thousand dollars for one of her coats, so that clearly isn't accessible to, anyone, to everyone. So she now does this basic line, which is factory produced um, in her own factory in Florence, Alabama, that employs local women from the area, works with our organic cotton from the fields, and is inevitably much more accessible price-wise. What she does, which a lot of designers do, which is also really beautiful, is that she allows people to buy in at, to the collection in a number of ways. So you may not be able to afford a $2,000 jacket from her, or even possibly, you know, the factory made line. So you can buy her sewing books and you can make them yourself. You can go to one of her workshops where you can go and sew them yourself. And a lot of designers in this space are doing this. They're making their work available for other people who want to put the labor in themselves. So Natalie was really one of the forerunners with this, but she does it quite beautifully. Rachel Frieri uh, uh, is in my last book, and she showcased her work at Aesthetica in London Fashion Week. And she does these really exquisite, very, very fine, labor-intensive uh, pieces that have this interesting juxtaposition between sort of S&M and something very beautiful and very delicate. She uses this matte black leather and this very pale powder pink sort of nude color. And each of the pieces are made from these quite labor-intensive, very beautiful handmade flowers, all from leather. And she showed during um, at Aesthetica at London Fashion Week, and everybody was overwhelmed by the beauty uh, and the workmanship in her work. Uh, and then they found out what the materials were. They just thought they were leather, and there's certainly a certain amount of uh, contention about the ethics of leather production and so on. Um, Nevertheless, uh, there are veg tanned leathers and there's wasted leather and lots of things, so there's lots of ways of using it. But what she didn't tell everyone was exactly what part of the skin she was using. So each one of her pieces are actually made from cow nipples. 
And so she was absolutely vilified in the press for showing it at an ethical, the, the most important ethical fashion trade show in the world, uh, out of dresses made from cow nipples. And there are literally thousands of cow nipples um, in some of these dresses because there are a lot of 10 petals, I think, to every rosette and a lot of rosettes on some of the pieces. You can see how many, I think there's 3,000 or something in the piece in the middle. So that's a lot of cow nipples, except now, um, bear in mind, obviously, there's a lot of, as I said, contention about the issue of the ethics of leather and so on, um, the pollution that's caused through the dyeing process and the finishing process, the fact that it's an animal product, etc. Except most of it, of course, actually is a byproduct of the meat industry. So if we weren't eating meat, it would be a different conversation, but many people do, myself still included. So. Um, the, ca the nipple, whether it's on a cow, whether it's on a pig, or whatever it is, is a part of the skin that is routinely discarded. Even designers that specialize in garments made from leather never get to see those parts of the animal. And they're deliberately discarded by the tanners um, because they know that people have a visceral, a human connection to that part of the anatomy. So they're discarded and nobody sees them. But the whole point of designers working ethically with waste is it's pieces of garments or fabric or materials that are being wasted. And nothing exemplifies that better than this. Even designers working with these materials never get to see that part of the skin because they're routinely discarded much further down that supply chain of the leather production. So in many ways, what she's doing really epitomizes the ideal of utilizing wasted materials. Um, but she was judged inevitably as her work being sickening, repulsive, grotesque, any number of things, having already been um, judged as being beautiful and exquisite and labor intensive until they found out what the materials were. Um, she's a very savvy designer. She knows very well what she's playing with, and she very particularly um, utilizes materials that call attention to uh, the dichotomy of beauty and the juxtaposition of it with disgust. So it's something that she plays with. She's not a commercial designer. She works mostly with celebrities and theater and the music scene and so on, so she doesn't need commercial success. And so that intellectual um, push and pull of challenging people is part of what she does, but an absolutely exquisite collection, whether you agree with the material use or not. Um, Maya Peace collection, one of my favorite designers. Um, inevitably, a lot of my favorite designers ended up in my book, so um, this is one of mine. Uh, Christine Myers, another Berlin-based designer who works with recycled materials, absolutely exquisite, mostly domestic materials. So um, tablecloths, napkins, uh, mattress ticking, um, she also uses denim uh, jeans and some military fabrics and some discarded Pakistan uh, quilts. So mostly vintage materials, exquisitely embroidered in many cases. The two pieces that you see on the left are actually from vintage flower sacks, so farm flour from, um, from mills, so uh, from farmers. And so the names and the graphics that you see on there are the names of the farm, the name of the farmer, the number of the bag, etc. They're all Bavarian flower sacks from anywhere from the late 1800s through to about the 1930s or so. Um, and being German, they have this great Gothic, Gothic script that they utilize. Um, and she's a designer that really does honor that uh, past and that heritage of the mixed, of the material use. So she honors and really plays places those halls and those stains as part of what brings value to the materials because it's honoring the textile's past life instead of hiding them. So the piece in the middle, you can see there, there are some stains. There's a stain right here in the front of the jacket. And it's not something she tries to hide because it's part of the value of that material. So this recontextualization of what constitutes value is a very important part of what many of these designers do. KMA is uh, another Austrian brand. Interestingly, for such a small country, there's some really uh, amazing work coming from designers out of that area of, of the globe. And um, Katha Hara, who's the designer between, uh, behind KMA, also works with discarded materials. So the one on the left is actually made from an Austrian prison blanket. 
um, Austrian prisoners, when they're brought into the inmate system, have to weave their own blankets, and that's the blanket that they use while for their term as an inmate, and the blankets are retired at the end of their incarceration. And she makes a line of men's and women's coats and jackets made out of those prison blankets. I have one, and I can tell you the material is... It, it, it has a power to it. There is a history um, embedded in it. These are, are powerful first choice materials. They are not discards that are a second choice just because they were available. She does also work with hospital bank blankets, with military blankets, and so um, extremely beautiful pieces. Um, the two pieces, the one in the middle is made from discarded scraps of fabric. She works with a number of different materials. Tiny, tiny discarded fat scraps. So I'm not talking about chunks, but tiny pieces of selvedges, pieces that are an inch wide or a, a, a half inch narrow. And she crazy stitches them all together onto a base material with uh, a wool felt in between and then they're treated with heat, the felt inside shrinks in it, so it gives this great texture. And she makes them from all sorts of materials, really beautiful in many cases. The one in the middle is actually made from um, cotton jersey again, same as Natalie Channon. And the one on the right is made from decommissioned parachutes from the Italian um, Air Force. Um, oddly, the Italian Air Force used cotton in their um, <laughs> in their parachutes. Everyone else in the world used silk. I'm not sure how the Italians ended up using cotton traditionally for their um, parachutes, but they did, and they're exquisitely finely woven cotton twill. And so she has a, a line, and the piece on the right is actually a wedding dress made from a discarded or a decommissioned uh, parachute from the um, Italian Air Force. Christopher Rayburn's a British designer, and he's another one of those designers that really has made a splash way outside his own geographic area. He's a very important British brand at this stage. He started uh, as part of what do they call the new gen in the UK, the new generation of designers that are awarded uh, various accolades during London Fashion Week, and she, he won, uh, I think, one of the new gen awards three or four years in a row. Uh, Top Shop in the UK fund that that program. And he's gone on and grown. Susie Menkes is one of his big supporters. You can always find her front row, front and center of all his fashion shows. And so she's helped spread the word about him. And he specializes mostly in uh, military fabrications. So, you know, as an example of all of the different types of materials that you can utilize, the assumption often when you're thinking about um, work as a designer working with discarded materials that you're going to work with somebody else's luxury discards, you know, that are beautiful, desirable fabrics to begin with. But there are many, many other types of fabrics that you can use. And he works with mostly military fabrics. So a really wide range of materials that include things like tank Tyvek from the Swedish uh, military, the Royal Air Force flying suits. He works with Virgin Airways hot air balloons, um, with parachutes again, Eurostar train uniforms. That's the, the train that runs across um, all of Europe. And so he uses all of these materials. In fact, the orange, both of these pieces, the piece on the left, the orange is actually from a parachute, and the pink spotted one is from a camouflage. Um, covering for a tent, I believe, a military tent. And so his designs generally are really very reminiscent of the type of materials he uses. They're very technical based, um, beautifully crafted. They are androgynous to a great degree. Many of them are roll-up max and so on, that they can be worn equally by men or women, obviously not so much the orange dress on the left, but most of his pieces, um, and incredibly functional because those are materials that have function built into them. So, for example, the, the Mac on the right rolls down into a purse that's no more than four inches by three inches and weighs, you know, a couple of ounces. Um, and, in fact, that's what he's particularly renowned for every season. He does a new iteration of these weightless, um, waterproof Macintoshes that roll up into these tiny little purses. Kerry Howley is another one of those designers from the UK that works with that dichotomy of disgust and attraction. And you can probably tell her materials here are discarded hair. 
So she makes exquisitely beautiful necklaces out of discarded human hair. And so hair, much like discarded socks, have that um, connection with, you know, it's something that's considered very beautiful and very lovely when it's attached and it's on your head and it's healthy. Um, but when it's plugging up the, uh, a drain, it's not considered quite so nice. And so that's what she works with, these materials that are considered really a bit, bit gross to most people. And she crafts these incredibly delicate, intricate um, patterns in necklaces made from human hair. So quite lovely. I'm going to finish with one last designer. This is an Italian brand, Carmen Acampus. Um, she's one of the better known ones again, although um, very distinctly Italian. She's, uh, the, the founder is actually Alaria Venturini Fendi. So you might recognize the last name, Fendi. She is indeed one of the Fendi uh, youngest daughters of the five sisters that transformed the Fendi partnership or the Fendi family business into what became an international brand. And so she started this collection, uh, Carmen Acampus, which uses waste materials. And she's really a, an interesting example of the breadth of types of materials that can be utilized for waste. So she uses all kinds of things, airplane seat covers, um, car seats, interior design swatch books, volleyball nets, old belts, Venetian blinds. It's like nothing she won't upcycle in some creative way, shape, or form. So um, if you see the bags on the far right, those little swatches, those are tiny little leather swatches for interior designers to choose what, much like the uh, wasted fabrics that Oslo de Castro uses, their swatch books used for interior designers to choose their colors for the season. In the case of interior design, they're tiny swatches couple of inches at most, or an inch by an inch in size, and they usually have the color name printed on top of them. So then she patches them all together and makes these bags out of these swatches. Um, also the one, you can see the big one here, you can see quite a mo lot more clearly that those are what they are. So a range of different materials, in fact, you can see on the right here. So all sorts of different color swatches of different materials. And the one on the left, if <laughs> you can't work out what it is, it's actually made from a switch, a plug that goes in the wall. They have samples too that get discarded, that go out of fashion, that get damaged. Um, every industry that makes anything has some form of waste. And so she specializes in taking these extremely incongruous materials and finding a creative means to upcycle them. So those are her purses made out of plugs and switches. Um, she also does all of her production in Africa, um, so it's a fairly traded company um, that trains people in the slums of Korogocho in Nairobi, and so they're paid fair labor wages. And she retails at totally luxury uh, brand um, retail outlets, so Dieci Corso Como in Milan, for example, is one of her main uh, outlets, so really high end. So I'm gonna finish off with that. And just say, you know, this is the, the covers of the last book. You know, what I try to do with all of my writing, and particularly in my books, is really to communicate what incredible beauty there is out there of from a, coming from a really wide range of designers that are working with an even wider range of materials that are generally considered worthless or discarded. And what they do, which is the most important part, really, is that they recontextualize value and they allow us to, to revalue what we can constitute as luxury in an industry. So whether it's whatever it was you thought of was recycled fashion, forget it, because there is so many beautiful, meaningful things being done out there that honor the stains on the flower sack, honor the halls and the lives lived of those textiles and tell those stories and they become an important part of the value of those garments and of those designs. Fashion really is um, the perfect vehicle to inspire change. It's an enormous industry, employs hundreds of thousands of uh, millions of people around the world from textile production all the way through to garment manufacture, weaving, etc. So it's a, it, it's a perfect industry really to inspire change in how we do business as well as how we consume and what we consume and how we quantify value. 
So all of the writing that I do, no matter in what space, is really about supporting emerging designers and showcasing what work there is for other designers to build on, from other designers to be inspired by, for consumers to purchase and to support. Um, and it really is all about conceptual cutting edge design. So I'll leave you just with some resources if you're interested in knowing more. I will say that none of the designers in the book are on my website. So <laughs> if you're interested in them, you have to get the book. Uh, that said, the website does hold hundreds of uh, designers that work right across the whole range of ethical design, fair trade, um, recycled materials, um, organic and natural sustainable fibers, new business models, etc. So thank you very much. Thank you, Seth, that was so interesting. Um, I did have a question, which was, I was really intrigued by the Schmidt Takahashi yeah. one, and talking about how the history of the garments was mm -hmm. so important. Mm -hmm. And I think that is like a real valuable thing. If, if these, some of these upcycled garments, you really knew what the history was. But if, if they're making stuff that they're getting from dumpsters and like, you know, Goodwill or something, how do they, how would we, you designers, go about getting the stories? Or well, in, in the case of Schmidt Takahashi, it's 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 their own recycling bins that they strategically place in particular oh. locations. So as consumers drop off the materials, they're able to ask them some of the history of the garment oh, use and record it. So they're not sort of street bins where anyone can drop off anything. They're in stores or particular locations where there's a captive audience and it's okay, as you're dropping off, please tell me a little bit about this and they record it. Yeah, um, in the case of Oxfam, which you know is a different thing, they're celebrities that are donating the clothes, so they get them to video little stories about, you know, I wore this dress to the Oscars and blah, blah, blah. And so that, of course, is quite captivating for well, I think you should resale. start a movement for people just signing their clothes. <laughs> Average <laughs> workers and stuff. It would be so interesting. To well, there's so many designers now, and many of these designers really on their websites, because um, everybody has a website at this stage, you know, so they tell their stories there of where their materials come from in many cases. So although it may not be on the hang tag, and in some designers' cases, it is on their hang tag, um, but you can usually often go to the website and find out where the materials came from, from a designer that's working with upcycled materials.